Martin Luther is perhaps the most popular figure of theological study outside of secondary literature on the life of Jesus Christ. As the foundational character of Protestantism to control Luther is to control the Reformation. And for this reason, Reconstructionists have done their best to create a Luther after their own theological, own theological image. Scott Clout's Luther is a Luther of faith. It's a Luther that he makes Luther out to be, has, which has nothing to do with the Luther of history. You cannot remove Luther from his actual writings. Scott Clout over at Zootown is a Reconstructionist. Scott's Reconstruction has a Marxist feel. The Marxist reading of history is everything's a power struggle. I hear a little of that in Scott when he critiques the Reformation as a movement that sought power, sought money and land, and, which were Scott's own words. He said Luther was simply trying to create his own religion. He wanted to be his, he wanted his own religion. He wanted to be his own pope. He was a cultist. This is clearly Marxist Reconstructionism. There's also an ideological reading of history and apologetical deconstructionism. This is Rome's reading of history, which has done its best to gaslight Luther into a sex-crazed, power-grabbing little monk. This is where Scott excels, not in facts or honesty, but in a sort of Eastern Orthodox or Roman Romantic reading of, of history, a Romantic reading of history that doesn't line up historically or biblically. It's ideology dressed up in history. Any critical, critical listener can hear it. Just ask yourself, does Scott Clout make an argument or does he just make claims without support? You see, he just knows a priori. He just knows beforehand that Luther, Augustine, and Calvin were cultists. He just knows because he's read some book by some Roman apologist. Just like he knows the fathers because he read, he read some Eastern Orthodox apologist. But you need to trust the facts, and Scott doesn't have any. I don't think Scott's trying to be deceitful. I think he's just untrained in historiography. Before diving into Lutheran waters, it is critical you have a basic understanding of middle medieval theology. I don't know if Scott attended a higher education or not, went to seminary or whatnot, or I don't know if he went to a good one at least. So I would encourage him, I would encourage any listener who wants to know about the Reformation, Reformational history, to read The Dawn of the Reformation by Heiko Obermann. This will give you basic social and theological categories that are needed to understand Luther. In addition, Scott should read Historical Fallacies by Carl Truman to learn basic historiography. Scott's sermon is a lesson on historical fallacies and, in, and informal logical fallacies. So I would encourage him to study, and I would encourage him to read uh, Martin Luther's basic theological writings. I would encourage him to read the Fathers and Augustine and Calvin before he makes wild claims. Simply reading books by Roman apologists and Eastern Orthodox apologists does not su suffice. As Christians, we have to be honest, which means hard work. It's hard work to get in the pulpit, especially for a minister who speaks, thus saith the Lord. So you have to be careful. We, we can easily, easily violate the ninth commandment. It has been said that there's one thing God cannot do, and that's change history, but historians can. I don't think Scott's a historian, but he has definitely changed history. Scott's Luther's, Scott's, you know, Luther, Luther's theology is not Scott, what Scott said. Luther's theology is doctrinal. It's, it was developed over time. Luther was an occasional theologian. He didn't write a single summary of theology, but he wrote as he suffered under concrete struggles wrestling for the gospel in the 16th and 17th centuries. He wrestled for the church and society. All his work is doctrinal. His doctrine develops. He had no single tower, you know, single tower experience that caused Luther to pen, I quote, if the doctrine of justification is lost, the whole Christian doctrine is lost. Those conclusions came after years and years of careful study. It's important to understand that Luther's theology matured, especially after 1521. This maturation began with the doctrine of imputation that followed his studies in 1515 and 1516, where he, where he wrote, I quote, We believe that faith such as this is our righteousness before God, for the sake of which God justifies us, imputes us, and regards us as godly and holy apart from all works and merit.
then in 15, 16, and 19, after studying Galatians and Hebrews and the Fathers, he redefined, redefined faith from hope to certainty, in which he wrote, through this faith, God rescues us from sin, death, and hell. By grace, God receives and saves us for the sake of his Son in whom we believe. Through the righteousness of the Son of God, we enjoy and participate in life and all good things. Scott claims that Rome and Luther agreed on grace. They both say grace. They both use the words, but their definitions are completely different. Scott's reading of Trent is comically overly simple. You can read anathemas after anathemas if you want to that condemn Luther's doctrine of grace and faith. They're not the same. Trent was, after all, a counter-reformational synod. They were there to oppose sola gratia, sola fide, and sola Christus. Scott's claims that Luther agreed with Rome in any soteriological fashion is, is comical, so ahistorical. Augustine, St. Augustine left a tension between the doctrine of salvation and that of the church as a dispenser of grace. In the Middle Ages, the Christian life was a pilgrimage from becoming to being. From becoming to being in the medieval church, the medieval church was a, a filling station to give grace. You went to church to receive this thing. Grace is a thing. Grace is stuff. And that grace allows you to do what you must do to be saved. Now, the late Middle Ages, a number of tensions existed. You had the Via Moderna, the nominalist way. You had the Via Antiqua, the realist way. You had semi-Pelagianism. You had Augustinianism. Luther was schooled in the Via Moderna. He had memorized large uh, portions of, of Bill's Facae Intebus. The Facae Intebus says that God will not deny grace to the one who does what lies within him. Or in evangelical terms, the evangelical Facae Intebus is God meets you halfway. Luther was taught that God is relentlessly holy and just. There was a tension between uh, God's mercy and the justitia die the righteousness or the justice of God. And Luther couldn't see how he could do what lies within him. He saw himself as a grievous sinner, and he saw that God could only accept perfection. He was not perfect, and he struggled with this. He struggled with the sanctification. Read his writings. You will see his struggle is not power. It's assurance. He feared God. He began to hate God's righteousness. He said, I hate God's righteousness because he couldn't meet it. Meet it. He was damned. And this is what drove Luther. In Luther's words, not Scott's. In Luther's words, contrary to Scott's assertion that he just wanted to be rich, no, he wanted assurance. He wanted peace with the Holy God. By the mid-1520s, his use of grace meant sovereign grace, not medicinal substance. Rome believed and still believes that grace is stuff. It's stuff. Luther began to see that grace is not stuff. He began to see that grace is God's divine favor. Grace is God's actions of mercy and long-suffering toward his people. Grace is action. Grace is God gave his only begotten son as a sacrifice to save us from our sins, to save us from God's wrath, which, God, which Scott denies as well. But that is how the church has always talked. I'd like to remind Scott, which he's trying to claim the church. God, God's wrath is true. Christ spoke on hell more than any other character in the Bible. You might not like hell, but you should believe it because Jesus did. In his lectures on Romans, Luther had come to disagree with the Roman consensus on the justitia die, the justice or the righteousness of God, that it was something that had to be made a reality. Luther moved away from the medieval doctrine of infusion into the Augustinian doctrine of imputation. Imputation is actually a biblical word. Imputation is not. In his lectures on Galatians, the doctrine of imputation of the alien righteousness, he calls the righteousness that we have before God an alien righteousness. is the active and passive obedience of Christ. That's crystal clear in his writings as he was clearly attacking the Franciscan pactum. He was clearly attacking the Roman doctrine of congruent merit. Congruent merit is Rome's belief that God accepts imperfect works and the Bible says, no, God only accepts perfection. Jesus said, you must be perfect as your father, as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. And for us, 
It's impossible. And we need perfect works, and we need the perfect works of Christ. Christ's perfect works save you. We are saved by his perfection. Christianity is a religion of salvation by good works. You must be saved by good works. It's Christ's good works and not yours, not any merit of your own. Luther was clear. That was his focus. Early on his lectures on Romans, he reached chapter 1, verse 17. Initially, he was working with the medieval notion of faith as credulity, as assent to the magisterial authority of Rome, which is where Scott, I think, wants to take you, away from God's word. But fiducia, he moved from uh, the idea of faith as credulity to faith as fiducia, trust and assurance, which is considered a bad thing by Rome, by the way. They don't like fiducia. They don't like trust and assurance. It was not until he defended himself before Cardinal Cajetan in 1518 that he got rid of the idea of works forming faith or faith formed by love, which is Rome. In the Heidelberg Disputation, he argued that we do not find justification in our dispu disposition. We find it by faith alone. And certainly by 1519, his series on Galatians, his notion of faith in God's word and our resting in Christ alone was firm. He's beginning to be a Protestant in 1519. In Rome, in Rome, the gospel is a new law. It's the easier law. It's easier than the Old Testament. Old Testament law is hard law. New Testament law is easy law. It's usually simply love or believe or invent or an evangelicalism. It's be nice. Be nice or perhaps you won't make it to heaven. Be nice or perhaps you'll get into heaven. But the question always remains, how nice do I have to be? How loving do I have to be? What if I had a bad day? What if I wasn't as nice as I should have been to my neighbor? What if I wasn't as loving? And, and Rome says, no problem. We got purgatory. Purgatory's got your back. But Luther began to develop an understanding that the gospel was not a new law. He began to see that the law was do this and live, whereas the gospel was Christ has done or it is finished. It is finished on the cross, Christ said, it means the gospel is complete and the gospel is complete salvation. Christ's got your back. All you got to do is accept it with a believing heart. Scott seems to want you striving. You can hear it in his Platonizing uh, Pelagianism when he talked about Augustine and Scott's questions to his, I think, Roman mentor. He asked this Roman mentor, is Augustine a saint? To wit, the mentor said, yes, but not because of his theology, but his morality. His works made him a saint. This is classic Pelagianism which the church condemned repeatedly, by the way, in council after council, affirming Augustine. That's history. History affirms, the church affirms Augustine. Also, you can't divide theology from morality. You can't separate the mind from actions. That's just silly. Luther's law of gospel distinction, as the scholar Odin has demonstrated, is found in the fathers Augustine and St. Bernard. The law of gospel hermeneutic is firstly biblical and very historical. Just read the Bible. You'll see the imperatives. You'll see imperatives all over the place. Imperatives are, are commands. Do this and live. Don't do this and die. The Bible is also full of indicatives. Take the Ten Commandments, a great example, right? The Ten Commandments we know is the law of God, but how does it begin? It begins, with, it begins in the indicative mood. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I am the Lord who's delivered you grace the indicative, but then the imperatives. You shall have no other gods before me and so forth. Law, gospel, distinction. Luther's influence was first and foremost scripture. Luther became good at Greek through Melanchthon's tutoring and Hebrew through Rosslyn's grammar. As Augustine, Augustine was, a, was his uh, second great influence. He was very greatly influenced by Augustine, but thirdly, he was, he was influenced by Tauler, the Theologia Germanica, and furthermore, you can't understand Luther without seeing the nominalist and scholastic influences. And Luther was not anti-Semite. He was a medieval man. Anti-Semitism is an enlightenment problem. So this is anachronism. It's a historical fallacy to call him an anti-Semite. Luther didn't remove books of the Bible. As Scott says, he doesn't remove Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation. Those were disputed books, by the way, all throughout Christendom. Luther did call the book of James an epistle of straw. He kind of didn't like it, but he did include it in his Bible. He did put it in the back, though. <laughs> but he included it. This goes to show that even though he had doubts, he trusted tradition. Luther never wanted to start a new religion. 
The Reformation was not a denial of tradition. It was a reformation of tradition. Rome deformed the church. Rome deformed God's word, still deforms God's word. Luther simply wanted to reform Rome. That's how he started. He started as a reformer of Rome, as many of his contemporaries, like Erasmus. Erasmus was a, a moral reformer. He wanted Rome to stop being so immoral, and he sought morality in Rome. He never left like, like Luther, but Luther didn't want to leave either, but he had to eventually leave when they, turned, when they wanted to burn him at the stake. He saw that he couldn't reform Rome, so he turned. So Luther has taught us that we obey God more than man. You must obey God more than tradition. If tradition errs, tradition can err. Churches do err, but God's word never errs. God's word birthed the church. God is wrong. The church doesn't give us the word. The word gives us the church. The church giving us the word is just Roman and Eastern Orthodox propagandist history. The history of scripture is the history of God's very breath. Scripture is God breathed, breathed out by God, and that breath of God fills the lungs of the church and gives us the church. As Scott said, Christ is our authority. I say amen. But unlike Scott said, Christ's tradition, Christ's tradition is it is written. It is written. That's Christ's tradition. The history of Antichrist is has God said? <laughs> I think Scott might be listening to the wrong voice. He's definitely reading bad history. If you want good history, if you want a good church, you might try Covenant Reformed Church. <laughs> Covenant Reformed Church, 2512 Sunset Lane, MissoulaURC.com. We meet every Lord's Day. We never take a Lord's Day off, by the way. We meet every Lord's Day, morning and evening. You can come at 1030 in the morning. You come 530 in the evening. There are two different services, but I encourage you to once. Uh, the, the morning service is more, is uh, we walk through the Bible book by book, verse by verse. The evening service is more doctrinal, theological. We are a historical church. We are a Catholic church in the, in the real sense of Catholicity. We're liturgical and uh, we're different. So. Hey, if you're liking these videos that I'm putting out and you want more history and so forth, come check us out. Alrighty, God bless.